Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Treating the Performance Horse, The Horizon, sponsored by BI and Covetris. I'm Amy Booker, and I'll be your host today. Today is September 19th, 2019, and our live webinar participants will earn one continuing education credit. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, you are not eligible to receive any CE for it. Our live participants can also ask questions of our presenter. Just type your questions into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll answer them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. I'm very excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Britt Conklin. Dr. Conklin earned his undergraduate degree from Texas Tech University, where he was recently inducted into their Hall of Fame. He attended veterinary school at Texas A&M University and College Station, and upon graduation worked at a large equine referral practice in Weatherford, Texas. He has been the continuing education advisor for the Texas Equine Veterinary Association, founder and host veterinarian for the Texas Equine Podiatry Conference, and is a member of the Texas Horse Council. He has been a practicing veterinarian and, own, and owner at Riata Equine Hospital, which was recognized in 2005 as a top five equine hospital in the United States by Horseman Magazine. He has a diverse background in equine performance, medicine, surgery, reproduction, and podiatry. Much of his career has been spent working with the Western Performance Horse as it relates to lameness and farriery. He is certified by the American Farriers Association and has consulted and lectured both nationally and internationally in equine performance medicine and podiatry. Dr. Conklin is currently a senior equine pro professional services veterinarian for Behringer Ingelheim Animal Health, where his focus is on sports medicine, pharmaceuticals, and endocrine-related laminitis treatment and management. He runs a sports medicine and podiatry practice near Amarillo, Texas, where he resides with his wife and three children. Dr. Conklin, we are ready for your presentation. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, good afternoon uh, to most people. Good morning to some. Um, I wanna thank Covetris and BI for giving us the opportunity uh, to speak to everybody today. I hope everybody's having a great day. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, treating the performance horse, kind of the horizon now that may be a little misleading in the sense uh, the horizon makes people think, well, what's new, what's out there? This is, interestingly enough, going to be a little bit more of a review than, than a long-term look at what's down the road. However, I will tell you, as it pertains to BI, uh, there are some interesting things in the pipeline uh, specifically related to some of the things we're going to talk about today, primarily joint health. So there is some horizon, uh, and I'll just give you two disclaimers today. Number one, uh, I do work for BI, so uh, some of it will be uh, from that angle as a, as a technical veterinarian. I will primarily talk to everybody just on the practitioner level. Um, I'm not an academician, nor are we going to speak kind of in a detailed research format. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking kind of at that level of practitioner level, the everyday uh, equine practitioner that out, that's out there looking at horses. The second disclaimer is is uh, a function of uh, the the all too common technical difficulties. I told Amy earlier that my computer crashed uh, just prior to this, so uh, I've pieced together uh, the content, uh, and it's a little. Some of these slides are a little bit older, so I do apologize. Uh, in advance for some of those. We'll get started. What we're going to talk about um, today uh, in this outline is, is really kind of three specific areas. We're going to just kind of look at sports medicine in general and, and what that means. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on osteoarthritis and, and how that progression works and, and then again, uh, you know, how we treat it. Uh, I've got joint medications just listed there, but that could include some parenteral therapies that we might use day in and day out. We'll give you just a little bit of a background to what those actually are. You know, from my perspective, I think of sports medicine as a little bit of an art and science, especially when we look at uh, lame horses that do a lot of different things, a lot of different disciplines. Uh, it takes a unique practitioner that uh, can kind of have an art side of their mind and a scientific side in a lot of ways. And, and you know, the art side can be broken down into several different areas as far as, you know, visualizing the horse, uh, the movement of the horse, um, dealing with the client. Uh, sometimes that can be an art in itself. 
And then obviously the science is applying the things that we know uh, uh, for the most part in Western medicine that are effective for the problems that we diagnose. You know, as an everyday equine practitioner, you know, we're, we're wrought with this dilemma oftentimes. Uh, in an easy sense, we, we can work on sports medicine in the overt lameness well. We see the problem, we know where it is, we effectively work up the, the issue, and uh, we diagnose it and, and, and develop a treatment plan accordingly. Sometimes, however, um, you know, our presenting complaint is not an overt lameness, but it's often just a performance limitation. And that can be uh, diff difficult as well. And we, the, the art part of that is this, is, is we have to think oftentimes beyond just strictly muscul musculoskeletal issues. And we have to look at the whole horse because as we've learned in uh, recent decades, a lot of the things we see in regards to performance limitations are not just limited to the musculoskeletal system. For example, uh, you know, most people would recognize that uh, equine gastric ulcer syndrome can be, uh, can be a problematic and, and um, uh, can cause performance limitations. Endocrine disease, another good one, can cause uh, uh, performance limitations. Neurologic components. So all of those we have to look at the horse in whole, uh, not just you know rely on an overt lameness. Um, we all work on different disciplines. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, easily said here, here as we you know speak to people across the nation. And it's important for a practitioner to understand that discipline, and often to understand what, what uh, common uh, clinical problems we have in those horses. You know, if you're a a thoroughbred a young horse uh, uh, practitioner, that's the type of horse you see, then, you know, endocrine disease may not be uh, one of those whole horse things you need to look at. It may still need to be in the back of your mind, but the point being is understanding your discipline will help you figure out where common problems are and how to treat those effectively. I like a saying that Ken Allen said, uh, a practitioner on the East Coast, many of you know him. Um, I think this is this is just the synopsis for veterinary medicine in the equine world. Absent a correct diagnosis, medicine is poison, surgery is trauma, and alternative therapy is witchcraft. So not only do we have to look at the horse in whole, we also have to recognize where our leanings are. If we're a surgeon, uh, you know, we're often thinking a chance to cut is a chance to cure. If you're a medicine person, you often think, well, if I can use this molecule, well, maybe it will help the scenario. If you're a, a farrier or a podiatrist like myself, I used to think that I could treat colic with a shoe, and, and that's just not possible. So it's important to recognize our limitations. And really the goal uh, for veterinarians is this. Within the limitations you're given, okay, that may be financial, that may be the diagnostic tools you have, it should be your job to do the best you can to obtain an accurate quantity quantitative anatomical diagnosis. A lot of words there, but I think you all would recognize accurate means where is the problem and quantitative means how bad is the problem. So we need to find the, the, the anatomical structure that is problematic uh, and, and we need to know exactly where that is and then, and then, and then quantify it. How bad is that problem? And uh, when we talk about medications, uh, oftentimes we, we get frustrated at different times utilizing medications because maybe they're, they're, they don't work or we've got a refractory case, but more often than not, we don't have an accurate diagnosis. And so some of those treatments may not be effective for the, the pathology that we have. So the diagnosis, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out where the problem is. Most everybody uh, knows how to work up a horse. You know, we're gonna start with the exam. Uh, we're gonna talk to the owner. Maybe we watch videos if we're just looking at performance limitations. And then again, we just follow the routine procedures that we do, uh, you know, localization. Uh, you know, there's obvious technologies out there now. Some of you may use them, some of you may not. Uh, you've got different things now that uh, potentially can help you figure out, you know, where that limitation is. Uh, front limb, hind limb, a lameness locator here. Um, and so we move on once we localize that area to a limb and begin to use uh, some of our diagnostic tools. Now the limitation 
reasons I totally understand. Uh, I can give you my background. I've worked in a large referral practice, but I've also worked uh, on my own. Uh, and uh, the, the tools uh, at one's fingertips vary from practice to practice and the financial uh, capabilities of the owners do too. So uh, I recognize full force that not every course is going to get an MRI for that complete, accurate, and quantitative diagnosis, but it should still be our job within the limitations that we have. Uh, doing good x-rays, learning to do good ultrasound, sometimes that can be hard. Uh, you know, having the other options to refer the horse potentially for uh, bone scans and, and, and further uh, higher end uh, diagnostic methods. If you just think in the general practice, again, just from the, a routine practitioner standpoint, and we were to ask ourselves the question, where is the most common area of lameness and probably overt lameness is how we would look at it. We would probably all agree that it's in, that it's in the foot, you know, obviously from the ankle down, again, depending on the discipline you deal with, but the far majority of issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis occur here. And just from a podiatry background, people generally like me to kind of talk about this area uh, because in reality, uh, it can be a difficult black box. Um, but what I teach people is this, is, is if you'll tend to look at the foot from a 40,000 foot view into three large categories, uh, that's generally where you're gonna find the majority of your problems. Actually, all of them lie in one of these issues. It may be an epidermal issue, okay? And, and in the epidermis of the foot, just consider the wall, the sole, the frog, um, it could be an orthopedic issue, uh, bone, joint, uh, you know, bursa or part of that synovial structure um, would be considered that orthopedic issue. And then we have a whole host of soft tissue problems that can occur as well. So we're reaching for accurate and quantitative. And despite that being a black box, if you just walked around every day and said, I've blocked this thing out, it's in the foot. Well, it can really be only one of three things. It's an epidermal issue. It's an orthopedic issue or it's a soft tissue issue. Now, the accuracy comes in into figuring out what exactly is going on. You know, if we were just to look at epidermal issues, uh, you know, the most common one we'd see on a day-to-day -day basis is an abscess, a foot abscess. And some of those can be fairly insidious and difficult to find, uh, and, and they're problematic. Now, this isn't a picture of an abscess, but this is a different type of epidermal issue. Obviously, some white line, some deterioration uh, in that epidermal structure between the tubular horn and the lamellar zone. Uh, but uh, epidermal issues can be problematic. I can't tell you how many times I've seen difficult uh, uh, abscesses that may have been diagnosed as other things. Uh, and so uh, it's important to understand how that epidermis works. And most of the time, pain in the epidermis is just related to uh, pressure in a closed space. Uh, you can think about an abscess. That's an easy way to think about it. Most of the pain in a horse's foot is secondary to pressure in a closed space. We've got a hard tubular wall and we've got a hard uh, bone structure underneath it. And any uh, change in pressure underneath there causes pain. Again, a quarter crack, another type of epidermal uh, uh, issue. And then, you know, even a funny one here, you got a horse that's got too much frog. He's got uh, an epidermal issue there. When we think about the epidermis, if we were to suck the guts out of the foot and look at uh, just the epidermal component, it's no different than your fingernail. I think everybody knows that. Uh, we have a, a wall, we have a sole, and we have that lamellar interface. And if we were to kind of uh, transect that and we were just to look at, uh, you know, the epidermis a little more specifically, we would have, you know, the pigmented part of the wall, um, which would be considered tubular horn represented here by the arrows. And then we would have what we call the primary epidermal lamina reaching inward. Everybody knows kind of what that looks like, the lamellar leaves that sit inside there. If we were to take a schematic here, and, and thanks to Chris Pollitt on these, um, we could see uh, you know, to the to the uh, left side of your screen, the little tubular horn or the pigmented side with that cream colored primary epidermal lamina reaching inward and the pink dermal lamina reaching outward. And uh, they obviously come together in an enlarged surface area to suspend the horse on P3 to the right there on the bone itself. 
And we can have epidermal issues. And uh, again, you saw some of those pictures before those, uh, before these. Uh, and we can have it in the tubular horn. We can have it between the tubular horn and the primary epidermal lamina. Or we can have problems between the primary epidermal lamina and the dermis itself. You guys know the most common or one of the most concerning epidermal issues is when that primary epidermal lamina releases or the actually secondary ep epidermal lamina releases from the secondary dermal lamina. This is just an example of that where the basement membrane uh, depicted by the, the dark arrow there has released itself from the basal cell of the dermis and uh, the Velcro begun, begins to come loose and we lose uh, the, the epidermal structure moving away from the dermal structure and we develop laminitis. So in reality, that's an epidermal issue that affects the dermis as well. And we know what those look like. We need to recognize, again, in sports medicine, we're looking at lame horses, we're looking at lame feet, that uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, laminitic episodes may have different etiologies. And the only one I wanna touch on here is the endocrine laminitic. It actually has a different pedal pathology. I showed you this picture before, a pretty significant laminitic where the Velcro has let completely loose. And uh, histologically, it would look like this. The endocrine laminitic is a little different. Histologically, they look like this. They actually have just stretched junctions between the epidermis and dermis. And the reason it does that is uh, it's secondary to the effects of insulin. So just be cognizant that uh, not all laminitics are, are, are the same uh, when dealing with that epidermal side. So that's kind of the epidermis in general, if we were, or the epidermal parts of the foot that may be problematic. The orthopedic parts, again, pretty simple things. You guys know that we have P3 in there is just an example of a, you know, uh, obvious issue with the, the septic pedal bone potentially where they've curated it out. That's a a bone uh, issue. Um, another example, when we're trying to get accurate and quantitative, this one would be a little more difficult. Uh, this is pictures from some proceedings at AEP quite some time ago in 2005. Uh, and that's just looking at an erosion on the fibrocartilage on the backside of the navicular bone. So the, the upper picture is just an MRI uh, with that little white spot depicting uh, what we're looking at on the bottom or the necropsied view of that little erosion on the back of the navicular bone. Now, that's difficult. We all know in our day-to-day -day work, we're not going to find that little thing necessarily with just some x-rays uh, and be hard-pressed to even consider finding that with an ultrasound. Uh, it would take advanced imaging to actually find those. So accurate and quantitative in this case versus this case would be very difficult. So that's orthopedic. Soft tissue, uh, again, there's a whole host of soft tissues here and thanks to Andy Parks here for uh, the glass horse in, in UGA, uh, great models and great schematics for, for you to share with clients to kind of look at what uh, the internal anatomy is. But, you know, soft tissue wise, uh, we all know that these are problematic to be very accurate and quantitative. Uh, we can see here, I'm just using the foot here as an example of, of how hard it can be sometimes to get that diagnosis. We've got the green navicular bursa behind the navicular bone. We've got the, the uh, deep flexor tendon with that uh, broad uh, expanse as it begins to attach underneath the semi-lunar notch uh, of the coffin bone there. Uh, we have the superficial digital flexor tendon as it begins to, to, to bifurcate up there in P1. So we have uh, bursas. Uh, we have tendon sheaths, so we've got uh, a sheath there, the digital sheath that's separating the deep, uh, the green body that you see here uh, and here, uh, that's separating the, the deep and the superficial. Uh, we have a whole host of ligaments. So, uh, you know, we've got uh, joints, we've got, uh, we've got uh, bursas, uh, we've got tendon sheaths, we've got ligaments, and we've got a whole host of ligaments that reach all the way up behind uh, the fetlock here. We've got uh, cruciate sesmoidian, we've got oblique sesmoidian ligaments, and then we have a straight distal sesmoidian ligament, and all those are below the tendons. Uh, and everyone knows ligaments attaching bone to bone. It's kind of tethering down uh, those structures. 
Uh, and then we have an interesting ligament that attaches to the top of the navicular bone. We've got the collateral sesamoidian ligament. Uh, some people call it the navicular sesamoidian ligament or the navicular suspensory ligament. And we also have another ligament that kind of holds the navicular bone down to the back of P3. Now the thing about this, and then we have tendons over the top, which most of you are very familiar with, the deep flexor tendon and the superficial, and then we have a common digital in the front. The point to all this is uh, what can go wrong down there? Well, I showed you the little fibrocartilage erosion. This is just a picture of an adhesion between the deep flexor tendon and the back of the navicular bone. The top image is an MRI with a corresponding necropsy at the bottom, and we can see we have a little welded down adhesion between the deep flexor tendon and the navicular bone itself. Again, that's very problematic to get accurate and quantitative. You can have problems with tendons uh, as well. That was uh, uh, kind of looking at uh, a little lower area, but this is a core lesion a little further up in the deep flexor tendon. Uh, and we may be able to pick that up with an ultrasound. So maybe accurate and quantitative would be a little easier in this scenario. And our blocking pattern may help us out there as well. Here are some linear tears uh, in the deep flexor tendon. And again, all of that is just to say the, the, the horse is very complex. Uh, and again, when we're working towards finding where the problem is and how bad it is, and then developing a plan to utilize, again, medicine, surgery, whatever it may be, we've got to know specifically uh, uh, because sometimes we'll have treatment failures uh, if we're not accurately diagnosing that. Now, we all know that a horse can get lame in many different areas, uh, joints, tendons, ligaments, muscles. So we're going to focus a little bit now and refine our look just to joint disease. Uh, this will be obviously a little more uh, um, influenced and, and focused into the treatments that we have for that specific area. And a little background about joint disease. I think we all know that it causes a significant loss of athletic use in our horses. Um, it's a significant factor in packing, impacting the economy economics in the horse industry. Uh, people spend a lot of money uh, out there. Uh, up to 80 to 100 million spent annually on total pain management in horses. That was a study done quite some time ago, and I would suspect that that's probably doubled at this point. Uh, we have a lot of therapies that are out there, but it's estimated that 60% of our lameness issues are related in some way to osteoarthritis. So let's talk a little bit about What's happening if I, if I actually have a joint problem? Okay, and, and I think everybody would recognize that on the right side, we've got pretty significant osteoarthritis of a fetlock joint, and that's gonna cause overt lameness. We would love as practitioners to pick those things up uh, prior to the progression that we see here. And that's one thing I wanna note. We gotta remember from that 40,000 foot view on joints as well, that uh, it is a prog progression. Uh, it usually starts or the problem starts with an insult or an injury uh, and we develop some type of inflammation. Now that insult or injury may or may not be structural. So it may not involve a true structural defect. It may be strictly inflammation. Uh, that can be problematic in itself too and we let inflammation go unresolved or we let injury go unresolved and we can develop a degenerative joint disease, arthritis, and over a period of time we all could end up with a picture like that. So as veterinarians, our, our, our love would be to pick these problems up early on, get the accurate and quantitative diagnosis. Is it cartilage? Is it ligament? Is it meniscus? Is it uh, synovium? Is it just strictly inflammation? And again, that is very difficult and, and, and I definitely understand that. If we were to look at the process of joint inflammation, let's just take the simple synovitis and capsulitis. Good little uh, um, uh, model here that just kind of shows a schematic where uh, on the left side and the top, we've got a normal fetlock with normal yellow synovium, nice blue cartilage over uh, uh, the ends of the bones and the fetlock. And uh, as we uh, um, perform, 
and potentially exacerbate or exaggerate that joint, we uh, end up uh, causing inflammation and inflammation secondarily causes effusion in the joint depicted by the increase in uh, joint fluid and that yellow fluid on the right side. And over a period of time, we can develop uh, with unresolved inflammation problems to the cartilage itself. And, uh, you know, that would be the beginning phases here and then obviously end stage OA here. And we're, we're oftentimes in our day-to-day -day practices battling horses in between those two stages, from the simple synovitis capsulitis all the way to end stage OA. And even though we can't effectively oftentimes get accurate and quantitative for inside the joint, we should try hard to figure out where are we in this progression? Am I just at synovitis, capsulitis? Uh, do I have injury in there? Or am I all the way down to end stage osteoarthritis? Again, uh, there's a lot of things that cause uh, OA. We know that trauma, we know that, uh, you know, a disruption, a disruption in the structural integrity of cartilage or uh, some of the other structures there uh, uh, can be the inciting agent, but also, you know, unresolved inflammation as depicted here, where we've got cytokines that breach the synovium, prostaglandins, metalloproteinases that begin to break down uh, uh, the integrity of the cartilage, collagenases and agrokinases, all of those that are normally produced by the body secondary to inflammation can be problematic. So let's just take maybe the stifle as an example, just to kind of make it a little more practical. Um, we all know the stifle is a very complex joint. Uh, we know that it has uh, a lot of supporting structures, a very big joint. It's got three distinct uh, joint uh, capsules, the medial femoral tibial, the lateral femoral tibial, and the femoral patellar joint. Uh, it has ligaments over it. Uh, uh, obviously, this picture here showing the medial uh, uh, patellar ligament, the middle patellar ligament, and the lateral patellar ligament. If we were to break that open anatomically, uh, we would all see an interesting structure that I know we're pretty familiar with. Uh, but for for me a long time, I didn't think about this. Now you gotta understand my background working with a lot of the Western performance horse. Uh, you know, horses, uh, the good Lord uh, designed most of them to move linearly, okay? We, we, we work them in straight lines. Uh, maybe they run around a track. Uh, maybe they do things in linear motions. In our Western sport horses, uh, we're working laterally a lot of times, especially in the cutting horse. And that was my primary discipline of work. And so some of these uh, uh, alternative pieces of anatomy um, uh, began, began to be more problematic than say, uh, you know, the horse that's running down the track or uh, doing linear work. And the meniscus is one of those in the stifle. Uh, we all know that we have two menisci uh, in that, uh, uh, that, that uh, femoral tibial joint and those act as kind of guardrails or little bumper rails to, uh, to help uh, support and keep in play uh, the normal articular motion of that joint, along with all of the collateral and supporting ligaments. Probably one of the more important structures that we often see damaged in this region is that cranial ligament of the medial meniscus, or what they call the meniscotibial ligament. That meniscotibial ligament can often be damaged as horses move laterally, tear loose from the tibia, and the meniscus becomes uh, loose from the top of that bony platform and no longer works well as a bumper guard for uh, the femur itself. So if we were to look at the progression in a horse like that, it's most of the time structural damage that occurs first and we have either stretching or tearing of that cranial ligament of the medial meniscus. We develop meniscal instability. That meniscus begins to extrude or move out. And, and a lot of you have probably learned how to ultrasound that medial meniscus inside the stifle. And you can appreciate uh, the meniscus squirting out and, and not being in its normal anatomical position, and that's all secondary to that cranial ligament of the medial meniscus being torn. Because of that, the joint develops instability, 
and we have abnormal articular contact between the femur and the tibia, and we develop erosions or problems in that cartilage. And uh, again, that's the progression from uh, a structural defect all the way down to uh, significant osteoarthritis. Uh, and, and again, uh, finding that diagnosis would be important to figure out how to address that. Now, everybody can probably see that if we were to stick medicine in there over and over and over, if we have the, 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 the meniscal instability, the meniscal extrusion, and the cranial ligament is gone, and the stifle is fairly uh, unstable, then uh, injecting that thing uh, as many times as you can is not going to help uh, the accurate diagnosis and the problem for that joint. Where we would all like to jump in, and where most of us do on a day-to-day -day basis when we're, when we're dealing with joints, is uh, we'd like to stop the progression in non-structural uh, damage. So just the inflammation, just the synovitis, just the capsulitis, just the early progression of problems. And we'd love to interrupt the negative effects, those cytokines, those inflammatory mediators uh, uh, from doing damage long-term to the, to the cartilage. All of you know there's a lot of treatments uh, out there, um, but a lot of treatments to treat uh, the er early issues, and then obviously um, uh, some of the latter problems may need further work. So it's not just medical. We can we can look at topicals, NSAIDs. We can look at all the things that we use. You know, our clients are using a lot of supplements. They're doing a lot of thing in that, in that regard. Uh, we could look at some regenerative medicine, and then again, obviously uh, there are times where. Uh, the surgical approach is very important. The goal in treating joint disease is really none other than this. We would like to reduce the pain that we see in the horse. We've got a lame horse, he's grade two. We would love to see the horse not be grade two. Our client would love to see the horse work better, run faster, jump higher, all of the things that it needs to do. But at the at the same time, we don't want to just reduce the pain. We would like to minimize further uh, pathology in the joint. Uh, we all, you, you all can see the difference there. If we were just to load a horse's joint up with carbocaine, we would effectively be doing the symptom-modifying osteoarthritic drug, the SMODE. We would be, we would be fitting into that category, but we would probably be detrimental to the D-mode or the disease modification of that joint. So we want to find products, things that actually do both of those. That's the whole goal. And CSU has done a lot of work, I'll show you in a second, to really hone in on things that improve the symptom and the disease. Not only CSU, but the Orthopedic Research Center there has done a great job at looking specifically at some of the products that are out there. So let's just talk about horses coming in the door and how do we treat joint disease. A lot of us you know, whether we see the horse or not, maybe we talk to the client, uh, we're going to talk about, hey, uh, you know, maybe we want to try some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory treatment at first and see if we improve, uh, you know, this little acute lameness that uh, has never shown up before. The horse has been good. And, and, you know, maybe we tell the client, give the horse a little butte or put the horse on some Equiox or give it a little Banamine. Uh, most of those drugs uh, are symptom modifying. I think we appreciate that. Now, they may have some disease modification because they actually stop the progression of that cytokine production. Uh, but for the most part, you could look at in, in, a, in kind of the big bell curve as NSAIDs being uh, symptom modifying. We have topicals that are out there. These are things that our clients do. And uh, there's a whole host of those out there. BI is pretty proud of Surpass. Uh, it's a great product. Uh, it has got a unique technology that allows uh, a slower release of diclofenac through those liposomal onions into the horse uh, uh, to have a very localized direct effect. And it can be used as a first line of defense when addressing inflammation. The interesting thing about Surpass, as opposed to all of the other topicals, is that it has been proven to be both symptom and disease modifying. So we, we have an added benefit there when we talk about Surpass uh, as a symptom modifying uh, drug. It actually has disease modifications as well. And, and then that was shown, uh, again, uh, I told you CSU has done a lot of work on different products. We can look at them doing work on as early as legend in hyaluronic acid 
uh, to as late as some of the things that are out there now, the IRAPs uh, and some of those products. So they look at what is truly symptom and what is disease modifying. They generally do it through the, through the chip model that they use uh, to look at that. Uh, and so they've done a lot of that. And, and, and uh, again, Surpass was uh, within uh, that category of research related to the chip model to determine that it's both symptom and modifying. Uh, when we looked at that study in, in de detail, we saw significant gross improvement to the joints. We also saw MRI improvements when compared to butte alone. And then we saw histological improvements uh, by using Surpass. So the good thing is it's symptom and disease modifying. So if we talk about the progression of joint disease treatment, we, we can look at non-steroidals. We kind of talked about that. They're mostly symptom modifying. We can look at topicals. Most of them are symptom modifying with the exception of Surpass being disease modifying as well. And then we can look at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, putting something in the joint. And I've just got HA and steroid written there because more often than not, that's our one-off. That's our first line of treatment when we talk about putting something in the joint. So I'll briefly talk about hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is an interesting uh, uh, sugar, is actually what it is. Uh, it uh, is a normal component of synovial fluid. Uh, it's made in the synovial membrane, and it's actually a component of the cartilage as well. So when the cartilage is compressed, it actually squirts out a little bit of hyaluronic acid in water. And so we have a, a natural lubricant in HA, and it's a natural structural component of the joint itself. Why do we use it? Well, it actually has been shown to have both symptom and disease modifying properties. Not only when we put it specifically in the joint itself, acting physiologically, but also pharmacologically when we put it in the vein. And uh, that was an interesting find many years ago, 97, 98, uh, when CSU looked at the use of, of Legend IV, and they were surprised by the fact that it had both symptom and disease modifying properties. Since then, a lot of research in the human field, uh, not only uh, uh, just in the veterinary field, but in the human field has shown that HA is a unique molecule. It's actually a signaling molecule. And uh, when we use a shorter chained, lower molecular weight hyaluronic acid like Legend, and we give it in the vein, it acts uh, like Paul Revere running through uh, New England, yelling the British are coming. It tells the body that there's been uh, a structural breakdown of the normal length of HA. And uh, it's saying, hey, I'm broken down. I'm a smaller component. There must be a problem. There's structural integrity that's been broken. And it signals the body and the synovium to begin to produce high quality HA in the joint. So didn't necessarily know that at first. We thought that early on, but now we recognize that because it's a signaling molecule, it actually has symptom and disease modifying properties at the joint level itself. Physiologically, we know that it has good shock absor absorption, it has uh, energy dissipation, and it is a good lubricant inside those large moving joints. So it has therapeutic effects. Again, whether we use it in the vein or whether we use it in the joint itself, it has both symptom and disease modifying properties. We can get HA from a lot of different sources. Uh, I won't bore you with too many details uh, related to it, uh, but some of it is actually uh, uh, of biological nature and some of it may be recombinant. Uh, it varies in its size, okay, and, and we know that, we call it molecular weight. Uh, it's it's kind of like the viscosity or thickness of oil. Uh, it comes in a lower molecular weight, just like I described before, or a higher molecular weight molecular weight. There's a, this is again one of those slides, I apologize, that uh, was a long time ago um, from my little technical failure, but it, it's in here and, and it's still a good slide. It kind of breaks down, you know, some of our previous HA products, a good study that they did, Uden did, uh, just in the Journal of Equine Veterinary Science in 97 that just kind of broke down molecular weights of different HAs. And back then, Hylartin 
was on the Martin market and high visc BI's product were both of the of the two higher molecular molecular weight products on the market. Now those exhibit more of a physiological effect. I told you that legend being the shorter chain is a signaling molecule and is like Paul Revere. I generally tell people that uh, the higher molecular weight products like high visc uh, are more like general Patton. You put those in the joint and they exhibit a physiological effect uh, as well. So again, what, uh, what um, products do people use? Well, it differs in every practitioner when you talk about molecular weight. Obviously, price and cost may influence the use of various hyaluronic acids, whether that's the cost to the client, you know, uh, we've got a client that can't afford, uh, you know, the, the expensive products, maybe the discipline, but but more often than not, the anatomical area or the joint being treated is what uh, practitioners uh, use to differentiate when they're actually going to use those products. So a high motion joint, they did a study, showed most practitioners will use a higher molecular weight product. Uh, example of the stifle, the carpus, the fetlock, uh, potentially the tibia tarsal joint, uh, uh, practitioners are using a higher molecular weight product. Uh, that's not to say it's across the board. Uh, I know a lot of practitioners and high Olivet in reality shouldn't really be considered a low molecular weight. It's more of a medium to uh, lower high molecular weight product. Uh, it runs about 650,000 Daltons uh, to up to 850,000 Daltons, just a measurement of viscosity. Uh, but a lot of practitioners will use a lower or medium molecular weight HA in lower motion joints. And obviously IV as that signaling molecule. So that's kind of hyaluronic acid in a quick nutshell. What about steroids? Most of you know this. It's a little bit of a review. Uh, we're using corticosteroids and not anabolic. Uh, I know that's a, a steroids carry a negative connotation, but our whole goal is to break up that inflammatory cycle and nothing does it better than corticosteroids. And the three that are most commonly used that are out there or methylprednisolone or Depomedrol, Triamcinolone or Vetalog. And again, there's an old picture. Vetalog is made by BI now. Uh, uh, and most of you know that. And then Betamethasone as well, an older picture of actually Celestone. Again, I apologize for the technical failure not having the newer pictures there. But those are the three that we most commonly use. And we're trying to disrupt that inflammatory cascade. Practitioners use different types of steroids, just like they use different HAs. Um, uh, again, it may be the age of practitioners. Maybe they're a little bit older generation and they didn't have the exposure to some of the new ones. Cost may be a factor, the discipline of the horse. More often than not, in today's world, people are looking at research uh, to help them determine what uh, steroid to actually use. And I think most everybody knows, again, an old picture, Fort Dodge Vetalog, BI's Vetalog should be sitting there. But from the uh, uh, OA model, we know that uh, triamcinolone appears to be the most joint-friendly or chondroprotective corticosteroid out there. And that was shown both in the symptom modification and the disease modification. Uh, it, it had both symptom and disease modifying properties. Uh, it, uh, again, is probably the most widely used and accepted corticosteroid. Uh, it's considered by many to be the best intra-articularly, and it's often the steroid of choice in high motion joints. Depomedrol, still used frequently out there. Um, the scare uh, came in when the uh, CHIP model showed that in large concentrations, the study was done at 100 milligrams per joint, that we could have deleterious effects to the joint. We actually ended up with uh, some cartilage erosion. And so the joint itself histologically and in, in, in kind of the, the capsule of disease modification uh, was very poor. We had really bad results at 100 milligram. Uh, the problem with that, and, and I'll just, again, I, I don't work for, for uh, um, the company that makes Depomedrol, but that study was done with a pretty high concentration. So there's a lot of people that still use Depomedrol. 
And uh, again, we don't know if we give 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams or what concentration, uh, maybe we wouldn't see those deleterious effects. But that's just kind of a, 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 a caveat there or a thought behind that. But in general, Depomedrol is considered kind of the deleterious steroid to be used in the joint. And so a lot of practitioners will not use that uh, in a high motion joint and, and tend to avoid it altogether. Again, old picture, but uh, we've got uh, beta methazone that's out there as well. The, the studies that were done many years ago with that, it probably is along the lines of transcinolone, but we really didn't see a lot of statistical differences compared to the control. And it really can't say that it's quite symptom or disease modifying, although I'm sure a lot of people use uh, beta methazone and have success. Uh, from, from BI's perspective, I think you just need to recognize that the research out there shows that Vetalog uh, appears to be the most chondroprotective and the safest uh, steroid to actually use. So what about other products? You know, we have PS gags or polysulfated glycosaminoglycans that we might use in the joint. Those were looked at as well. Most of you know that as Adequan. Uh, uh, and uh, they were actually symptom and disease modifying too. So we saw improvement when we gave Adequan, both in how the horse looks and both in how the anatomy of the joint looks as well. Early on, there were concerns regarding uh, some issues giving Adequan in the joint. Uh, some people had some sepsis issues. I think the two little nuggets that I would give you if you're gonna put Adequan in a joint uh, are this. Number one, uh, probably e even if you don't, I would still consider using uh, potentially an antibiotic, maybe amicacin with it but avoid mixing uh, adequan or polysulfated glycosaminoglycans with corticosteroids. Um, and uh, again, th those would be my kind of two things, two little nuggets I'd give you. What about IRAP? A lot of you have been exposed to IRAP. You know about IRAP, autologous condition serum. Uh, it, in those re research studies, showed to be symptom and disease modifying as well. So we know IRAP1, IRAP2 potentially are good products. The Prostide product out there uh, potentially is good too, based on uh, 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 the similarity in what it actually is. Um, but those, again, uh, filled the criteria of being symptom and disease modifying. Stem cells, won't get into too much detail there, but we know we can derive those from subcutaneous fat or bone marrow. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there's quite a few studies out there that show some good results related to improving some of the structural defects that we're talking about. So we were kind of battling the inflammatory part of it and, and you know, stem cells and PRP and some of these other regenerative products may be better at dealing with some of those structural defects. I'll just briefly mention bisphosphonates. Uh, they carry a lot of... Uh, 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 I guess a little, a little concern at times, uh, you know, with some of the publicity out there. But at labeled use, these, these can be very effective and very beneficial uh, in uh, joint disease. Now, you don't think of it necessarily as the cartilage or the synovium uh, or anything related to hyaluronic acid inside the joint. But you got to remember, we have a subchondral bone plate underneath cartilage that when we do MRIs on a lot of these horses, we will see defects in those regions. And potentially bisphosphonates can help uh, some of those issues when we have that accurate diagnosis. They may be beneficial also in the end-stage arthritic horse who has got a lot of bone pain based on uh, clinically what we see out there and the modifications of pain related to their use. So just a brief mention there, they, those may be beneficial as well. I'll just quickly just touch on parenteral treatments. It won't take long, we're about out of time. But when we look at parenteral treatments, I'll just give you the brief synopsis related to the CHIP models and what was symptom and disease modifying. We know that hyaluronic acid, like I said, given parenterally in the vein is good. It has symptom and disease modifying properties. We know that Adequan is good as well. Uh, it, it possesses symptom and disease modifying properties. And we also know that Pentasan uh, has been good. Now, I know it's difficult to get and not uh, commercially available, but at one time it was floating around pretty routinely. 
And uh, it has actually been shown to have symptom and disease modifying properties also. So. So I think the summary is this, there's many approaches if we're just talking about joint disease, but as a practitioner, my goal in reaching for a product just on the medicine side would be to find products that fit the bill, that fit the category of providing symptom modification or pain relief and disease modification or structural improvement uh, to that joint. Uh, we know with NSAIDs, again, just to review, surpass fits that category. We know that hyaluronic acid, again, an older uh, slide here, legend should be in there as well. High vis, that legend. We know that Adequan uh, provides symptom and disease modification. We know that the steroid Vetalog provides symptom and disease modification. And then some of the regenerative therapies that are out there actually provide symptom and disease modification as well. So I think with that, I'll stop, and I think that Amy may have uh, opened it up for a few questions or has got some out there. Amy? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Conklin. This has been great. And we have several questions um, from Portugal, of all places. Um, so our first one, they want to know, uh, can you share where they can consult those fantastic images of ligaments? So uh, a lot of those came from from the glass horse. I would look up glass horse. Andy Parks from the University of Georgia, uh, working with him, has developed some great glass horse models. And a lot of you probably have it. They have it for some anatomy, not only musculoskeletally, skeletally, but also GI. So I would just look up glass horse and kind of work your way through and you can probably get to the root of those. Great. All right, here's another question from Portugal. Um, in small animal medicine, is it assumed generally accepted that nutraceuticals, um, chondroitin, chondroitin and glucosamine for joint disease don't have enough scientific support? And how is that in respect of horses? Well, I think any oral supplementation has always been a little questionable as to their effectiveness. I would have to say that uh, there's a few products out there that have done some research to show some benefit. And if we're speaking specifically about chondroitin and chondroitin sulfate, we would have to look at, uh, you know, Cosequin. There's probably some others out there and I'm not trying to advertise for anybody, but I would say that there's some limited research in some of those products to show some benefit. The far majority of oral supplemental products have not been studied well enough and definitely not to the degree of the chip model to give us the firm feeling that we have symptom and disease modification. Most of the uh, research that we're talking about on those oral supplements, at best they show symptom modification. Nobody has spent the money to look in detail uh, like they have with the chip model. All right. Um, someone else wants to know is and I don't know, how to, I, don't know how to speak, I don't know how to speak Portuguese, I'm sorry. I hope you can translate. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're asking the questions in English, so I think we're good. Um, is platelet-rich plasma an option for treatment of OA in horses? Yeah, I, th I think while, uh, you know, none of it is labeled necessarily, I think uh, for the most part, a lot of practitioners have gotten used to using that as a consideration. Now, there's some apprehension when you talk to different people. If you talk to some folks, uh, well, I won't even mention, but there is some apprehension. The far majority of practitioners that do a lot of joint work have gotten themselves comfortable with PRP. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, um, depending on the kits used, uh, depending on exactly uh, uh, the manufacturer that you're going with, I would just recommend that you uh, take the time, if you have not used it, to reach out to uh, practitioners that have and find out exactly which one of the products they're using and have been fairly effective with it. It is a form of regenerative therapy. All right, um, we have one more question. Um, in spite of corticosteroids being a good anti-inflammatory drug, doesn't it increase chondrocyte lesions? So we are told by small animal veterinary specialists, what are your thoughts? Well, about all we know is kind of what I presented, that uh, at the dosages within uh, uh, the chip model research, we uh, looked at triamcinolone itself at that dosage, and it actually had improved 
improvements to that histology. histology. So we didn't see chondrocyte uh, destruction. Now we did see deleterious or negative effects with the longer acting depots like Depomedrol or methylprednisolone, and that was at 100 milligrams. So a lot of it may depend on the uh, uh, obviously the the animal type. I don't know the difference between a horse and a small animal, uh, but also the concentration of drug, the type of drug used, and whether it's in vivo or in vitro. Uh, in vitro is not necessarily representative, nor you know as to what would be going on in vivo. And so the chip model is really good because it kind of hits it in vivo at the concentration used. And we know that triamcinolone appears to be the uh, the most chondroprotective steroid out there. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Conklin, for your presentation and all of your expertise today. Um, your audience is very grateful. They keep saying thank you, um, that they've really enjoyed today's presentation. So thank you to BI and Covetris for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you to everyone who participated today. When you exit the webinar, you're going to see a survey. Please complete every form field and give us up to two weeks because we manually process these certificates. Uh, we'll email them to you as soon as they are ready. Thank you, everyone. This ends our webinar presentation.